The next uh, speaker will be Dr. Yvonne Morel. Um, Yvonne is Associate Professor of Pediatrics here at University of Pittsburgh in the Department of Pediatrics, and, and she's also Director of the Inpatient Services in Cardiology. Uh, and she will be talking about interstage care and pre gland management. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to speak today on interstage care and pre gland management. So uh, the single ventricle interstage period has been uh, historically defined by the American Heart Association as the time between discharge from the initial palliative procedure to the time of the second stage palliation for the infants who are shunt dependent sing with single ventricle heart disease. Historically, this is associated with high mortality rates. This is because there's parallel circulation, which creates a dependent relationship between pulmonary and systemic blood flow. Uh, the arterial blood oxygen, uh, oxygenation depends on the balance between these two systems, the pulmonary vein saturation and the systemic venous saturation. Anything that affects the balance of these things uh, can uh, critically affect the oxygen delivery to tissue and lead to major adverse events. Interstage death can be due to multiple reasons, a recurrent or residual lesions resulting in the change in oxygen saturation, typical childhood diseases like viruses and URIs, or even arrhythmias. Study demonstrated um, breaking down to BT shunts and RV to PA uh, conduits. Uh, in both groups, there was at least 50 around 50% re-intervention uh, during this interstage period. So it's common uh, and happens frequently and have to be uh, monitored closely in order to uh, prevent a major adverse event. So within the acute care uh, unit, our interstage management focuses on maintaining hemodynamic stability with acceptable oxygen saturations. We do this with titration of oral medications in the hope that uh, we can transition them to home. We focus on using ACE inhibitors, digox digoxin, diuretics, and antiarrhythmics uh, if needed. We also, uh, one of our hardest uh, objectives is to achieve a stable feeding regimen that provides adequate growth. We aim for 20 to 30 grams per day. We typically always have to use fortified formula up to about 24 kcals per ounce. And it's often a com combination of NG or ND feeds with our oral feeds. Looking back over the last 10, 15 years, uh, about 90% of our patients do need a combination of an N uh, NG tube with their oral feeds. As neck is a particular concern during this uh, high-risk uh, interstage period, we uh, implemented a high-risk feeding protocol uh, to standardize the feeding approach to our patients. Typically, uh, just after surgery, they're not deemed appropriate for PO feeding for many reasons. And so a PE tube should be placed. Uh, and we can initiate feeds either by bolus or continuous. Either way, they're started very slowly. If you're using intermittent feeds, it's two mLs per kilo every three hours. And if a continuous, it's somewhere between 10 to 20 mLs per kilo per day. In order to advance this, we do that also very slowly and watch for signs of intense intestinal compromise. If they're on bolus feeds, we'll increase two mLs per kilo every 12 hours, um, and continuous is two mLs every 12 hours with a goal of 100 mLs per kilos per day. And so it takes us a long time to get there. And we use TPN and lipids to, to meet our caloric uh, goals during that period of time and titrate that down as we titrate up feeds. So the, uh, another very important aspect of acute care management is caregiver education. Um, this starts immediately upon arrival to our acute care unit. It, it covers quite a bit. Uh, it, uh, caregivers are, are expected to understand uh, what equipment they're going to have to use, how to administer the medications, 
how to make daily measurements of their baby uh, in weight, pulse ox, and uh, among other things, how to use, if going home, potentially a home monitoring device, like a pulse ox, and then how to use the telemedicine um, programs. So as you can imagine, this is a significant amount of demand on the family and can create uh, significant family stressors. There was a study that was published that looked at families with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and they did surveys at three different time periods and compared them to adult norms. And it was found that the quality of life and well-being of these families is significantly lower than uh, when compared to adult norms. And then they, drilling down a little further, looking at moms versus dads, mom's quality of life and well-being uh, was significantly lower than the father's. So a meta-analysis was, was done uh, of the literature uh, looking at complex congenital heart disease and parental mental health. And it was found that uh, parents of complex congenital heart disease patients are at significantly elevated risk of psychological problems. They, almost 30% of the people that were surveyed have uh, PTSD. Uh, more than 80% presented uh, with clinically significant symptoms of trauma, and 20 to 50% report symptoms of anxiety and or depression, and 30 to 80% reported experiencing severe psychological distress. So knowing that and understanding that over the last few years, it's become uh, a focus uh, for uh, the cardiac uh, unit uh, at Children's Hospital. And um, uh, several programs have been implemented, uh, both looking and focusing on making the hospitalization experience for the families better, understanding and screening for maternal depression, and most recently, formation of a family advisory board in the hopes that we can understand where the um, stressors uh, are and how to improve those uh, during the hospitalization. Some centers have even um, uh, hired a, a dedicated a psychologist um, because of the, the importance of maintaining our parental mental health as they will be the sole providers when they go home. So our patients who um, are, we feel would be ready for discharge uh, need to have demonstrated long-term hemodynamic and clinical stability with acceptable oxygen saturations. They must have acceptable weight gain on a stable feed feeding regimen without concerns and uh, stable echoes without significant residual lesions that can lead to, as we covered, uh, major adverse events. And finally, and most maybe uh, one of the most important things is the parental readiness for care. So transitioning to home warrants ongoing vigilance. Uh, so many centers have uh, implemented a home monitoring program. Programs. The first home monitoring program was described by the uh, group from Milwaukee in the early 2000s. And the home monitoring programs allow in home surveillance to detect psychological changes that may predict demise of these patients. This, uh, these monitoring strategies consist of a home oxygen saturation monitoring and home weight checks. The frequency of this is different depending on the center and the program. Also, in addition to that, families are taught red flags. Uh, these are, uh, among many things, heart rate trends, oral intake, and then additional signs of cardiac or non-cardiac illnesses. It's found that when using a home monitoring program in conjunction with the nutritional bundle, uh, the National Pediatric Cardiology Quality Improvement Collaboration demonstrated a 28% reduction in interstage growth failure. So um, by using these interstage home monitoring programs, there have been single, single center reports that have demonstrated a reduction as low as 2%. Um, again, the uh, MPCQIC, the National Pediatric Cardiology Quality Improvement Collaborative, reported a decline uh, in their centers of an interstage mortality of greater than 40% between the years of 2008 and 2000. 
16. We uh, established our single ventricle clinic uh, in 2007. At that time, so, uh, patients were either discharged home uh, or to a medical home called the Children's Home. Uh, and then a select few would live with us. Um, by 2010, all shunted single ventricles were being discharged directly to the Children's Home to follow there during the interstage uh, period. Uh, all patients were discharged with a three ring binder in order to easily track their data that came back with them on their weekly visits. And review of our data demonstrated that after transitioning completely to the children's home, we had uh, no out of hospital interstage deaths since 2011. Unfortunately, that program is not available to us anymore. Uh, it's, uh, and so we've been transitioning to establishing a home monitoring program. We've decided to use the software platform CHAMP, which is provided to us by Kansas City, and it stands for Children's High Acuity Monitoring Program. It uh, gives us a, a remote home monitoring with the use of a parent-facing mobile application for data entry by iPad. And then we get, as a healthcare team, a web-based web portal that we can um, uh, access anywhere. Uh, in addition to it being a data, data entry and a patient home monitoring program, it is a research registry, so able to share and, uh, data from other centers and receive data from them. We are able to build in alerts. Uh, there's a 24-7 instant alert algorithm that, can, that is being set up, and uh, we also re would receive a daily summarized care list uh, to the healthcare team. The other options you can, uh, we can have are weekly reports sent to the patients, the primary cares, and the primary cardiologists. The interstage team uh, consists of many uh, people, uh, the physician, APP provider, nurse coordinators, neurodevelopmental psychologists, speech, occupational, and physical therapists, and, and nutritionalists. Everyone is there to provide um, the support and uh, care that these patients require, and to also provide the support that the families uh, need. During this period of time, after discharge, there are significant uh, risks for readmissions. Uh, the MPCQIC looked at 815 patients across their 50 centers, and uh, there were 66% of those patients had an unanticipated readmission. That median length of stay for readmission is only two days because 67% of them are usually due to minor changes in clinical status, those red flags that we teach uh, the families. 6% were due to the, ad, uh, only 6% were due to major adverse events. Of those adverse events, uh, most of those were need for IV antibiotics, either because of a surgical or a respiratory infection. There was a low incidence, 16% or so of cardiac arrests, 11% was a significant aspiration event, and, th and then only one patient had a stroke. So final thoughts, uh, interstage period, historically known as a uh, high risk time for mortality, but establishment of an interstage monitoring program has been shown to decrease this mortality rate significantly. Reemissions are common, but thankfully serious adverse events are not typically common. And um, standardized feeding programs along with the interstage, uh, interstage home monitoring programs can significantly help to reduce the degree of interstage growth failure. Thank you.